John chapter 9. And we're going to talk just a little bit more about the blind man in Christ I, uh, You know, God blesses us. I got, I got I, I'm telling you, he blessed us with the rain Friday, but that wasn't the biggest blessing I got that day. Diane, while I was over in town doing my running around, she was on the way up to Perry to pick up two of the grandkids and bring them back to spend the night with us. So that was, that was pretty special. I couldn't wait to get home Friday evening because they were there. But when I got there, I immediately walked into my office to lay my Bible and everything down on my desk, and I saw this, uh, this note that Luke had, uh, had put on my desk. And he drew three crosses with the sun shining, and he wrote, Reach for God, and God will reach for you. Love Luke. Nine years old. That was blessed. That was blessed. Keep that in my Bible. I want you to think for a minute about a Christian, a new Christian, somebody that just came to Christ. Okay? <coughs> Let's say that there's a new Christian. They have just come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay? They are just beginning their Christian walk. And I want you to ask yourself two questions about that person. Okay? Who is it that will most encourage that person? in their new Christian world. Stop and think about that. But then the second question we need to ask is this. Who will be the most discouraging to that person? Because you know, you, 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 you're going to have both. We know this, right? We who have been around for a while know that there are going to be times when you feel very encouraged, but then there are going to be times when you feel very discouraged. So we have a new Christian here. We have a new convert. And what should we be doing? We should be encouraging them. We should be building them up. We should be discipling them uh, in their Christian faith so that their faith grows. Okay? And so the answer to the first question is who will most encourage this person? Hopefully, the answer to that question will be Christian. Okay? The church. But who will, who will it be that most discourages that person? Now, you know what? We could say, well, it's those people who are completely opposed to Christianity and any kind of religion, and there are plenty of them out there. But do they really care about that person that just became a Christian? No. You know what? One of the things that's been said of the church is it's the only army in the world that shoots its wounded. And that's an indictment, folks. But you know what? Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's true. But here's what I have found. I have come to believe this. That I think the people who are most discouraging are the ones who have a form of religion, but they don't know the true love of Jesus in their heart. They don't, you know, the Bible says in the last days there are people who have a form of righteousness, but they deny the power of it. What does that mean? Have you ever stopped to think about that? You know what I think it means? They say they're Christians, but they ain't. And you know what? There's a lot of people masquerading as Christians that really aren't. And it's those people who have, the, a lot of times it's the people who seem the most religious outwardly who are the most discouraging to new Christians because they can't encourage them and they, they tell them everything that they're doing wrong that they need to do better. And that's discouraging for somebody. You know, you don't want to keep hearing discouraging things over and over and over again. If you do, the tendency is to become discouraged and just quit trying. But listen, if we hear encouragement, and if we give that new Christian encouragement, then they're going to want to grow in their faith and grow in Christ. And that's the goal, folks. That's what we're all supposed to be doing. And you know what? It's this very type of thing that we find in the story of this man that Christ gave sight to, the man who had been blind since birth. Christ gave him a sight between him and the Pharisees. You see, who was it that was encouraging him? It was the people who he who knew him as the blind man, and now they saw that he had his sight. They were rejoicing. But when he got to the Pharisees, what were they doing? They were discouraging him. They had a form of religion, but folks, they didn't know who God was. 
They knew about God. There's a difference in knowing about God and knowing God. A big difference. You know, there's going to be a lot of people, the Bible says, when they come before God, He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And these people are going to be people who were outstanding Christians in the community. These are going to be people that everybody thought was saved in the end. And God's going to say, I never knew you. Folks, let me tell you something. We have to be careful. We might know about God from reading His Word, but do we know Him in here? See, that's what we have to worry about. Do we know him in here? Because if we know him in here, then we're going to be an encouragement to each other. But that's not the way it was with this man. So let's read together. If you would stand with me. John chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 13. Just a few verses here. And they brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. In other words, that had been blind. And it, was on, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now see, that right there is the sticking point with the Pharisees. It was the Sabbath. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? <laughs> and there was a division among them. I love that. And they said unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of this man? You know, here were the leaders. Here were the religious authority. Here were the PhDs. And they were asking a man that was uneducated on the street, had never held a job in his life, according to their standards was nothing. But they're saying, What do you think about this? And he looked them dead in the eye and said he's a prophet. Boy, I don't think they wanted to hear that. I don't think they expected to hear that from this man. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Father, I pray that you would teach us from your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that we can learn. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would not only learn, but we would apply and live it in our lives every day for us. In your name we pray. Amen. First thing we need to look at is this problem of the Sabbath. This thing of the Sabbath. Now, you have to stop and ask the questions. Why in the world did the Pharisees hate Jesus the way they hate him? Because let me tell you something. They hated Jesus. They didn't like him. And you stop thinking about, well, you know what? They were the religious authorities. They really were the rulers in the nation of Israel. Now, they were under Roman rule, but as far as the, the nation of Israel went, they were the rulers. They were the top ones. They were in charge. So why in the world do you think they hated Jesus? Do you think maybe it was because they questioned, he questioned their authority? Well, yeah, it could have been. I'm sure that was one thing. Let me tell you something I've learned about people. If there is someone who gets offended because you question them, get away from them. Get away from them. You know what? I have, I have uh, had dealings with people like that before, and I'm sure you have too. You know, I used to work for a particular man uh, in, in a town not too far from here. If, if you asked him a question, he, he didn't like you questioning him. And he would never give you a straight answer. Never. Ever. For 17 years, when I finally saw a man from time to time, I'd ask him a question, and he would never give me an answer. And I mean, the questions I would ask would be yes or no. Very simple, okay? He would never answer. He'd go into this long diatribe, and he'd walk off, and I'd go, he didn't answer my question. He just wouldn't do it. And there were times when you would ask him a question, and he would look you in the eye, and he would flat tell you, you don't need to worry about that. In other words, how dare you question me? Now, folks, let me tell you something. If you run up on a person like that, just get away from them. Just get away from them. I have had people, you know, I, I, I understand that people respect the, 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 the position of the pastor, okay? And, and I guess that's a good thing. But let me tell you something. I'm just human like y'all are. I don't care if you question me all day, every day about anything I say up here. Because you know what? I'm human. I can make a mistake. You might know something I don't, and I need to learn that. So I welcome you questioning me about anything I say and anything I do. 
It doesn't scare me a bit. Hey, if I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong and I'll change. But people that have this authority complex, I guess, oh, don't question them because they're the authority. You think they were mad and they hated Jesus because he questioned their authority? Yeah, probably so. But that wasn't the real reason they hated him so bad. You know what? Some people say, well, uh, they probably hated Jesus because he didn't come to give them and get permission to do what he was doing. You know, we're in charge. You have to ask our permission. And I, I remember when I was up there, early on when I was up there in my career, uh, you know, we had a son that decided he was going to the University of Georgia and got accepted. And I thought, holy cow, i got to come up with some extra money. So I started looking to work a little overtime and, you know, there was this part-time gig that came open working security at a bank that was opening up. They used uh, certified law enforcement officers. And I happened to know the guy that was going to be the branch manager. He said, hey, yeah, you want the job? I said, yeah, I want the job. He said, be here on this day. It's grand open. Okay, not a problem. Well, I had to get it approved to do that through the, through the PD. And so I had to go see the captain. And the captain sent me down, and he started just raking me over the coals. That goes through me. You don't do anything like that unless it goes through me. I said, okay, I'll keep that in mind in the future, but I got this job, it's mine. Sign that piece of paper, or I'm going to do it without it. You know, but he had this thing. No, no, I got to approve everything. Well, approve it. You know, that was my attitude, and I went on and worked. And thank God he provided that so we could get that young into through Georgia. <clears throat> but listen, they probably wanted everything to go through them. What they didn't understand was that Christ had already gone through somebody that outranked them pretty big. Okay? And he didn't care about them. You, don't want, you want to know the real reason that they hated Jesus? It was because Jesus was exposing their sin. That's why they really hated him. That's why they wanted to kill him. And they were looking for anything and everything that they could get just to kill him. And now they were saying, we got him because he broke the Sabbath law. And you know what? According to their rules, he had broken the Sabbath. He had. Well, you say, well, how in the world he broke the Sabbath? Well, number one, uh, he, he broke it by making the mud. You know, the Bible says he spit on the ground and he, and he made clay. He made mud and he put on a man's eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man did that and he could see you know what? The first thing they did was they was talking about making mud. You can't do that on the Sabbath. You see, that's manual labor. And you can't do manual labor on the Sabbath. How ridiculous can you get? Let me tell you something about it. They even had one that said, if you walk from upstairs to downstairs and you've got a handkerchief, you just broke the Sabbath because you're carrying a burden. A handkerchief. How can you say that? Oh, but if I walk from here to there with that, that's breaking the Sabbath. It's breaking the Sabbath because you're carrying a burden. Do you think God cares if I got a handkerchief in my pocket and walk down there? No. No. They said you can't do all kinds of things. You know, you couldn't even light a lamp or extinguish a lamp on the Sabbath because that would break the Sabbath. I guess you're supposed to sit in the dark. Folks, it was ridiculous. And they said that Christ, because he made mud, was doing manual labor, and that was breaking the Sabbath. What I'm sitting here thinking is, why weren't they rejoicing that this man had been given his sight? That's what I want to know. Why weren't they rejoicing? Folks, listen. He broke the Sabbath because he made mud, but then because he healed the guy. Look, let me tell you something. They had rules about practicing medicine on the Sabbath, too. You know now, let me tell you how ridiculous this is, okay? It was okay to practice medicine on the Sabbath if it meant you were going to save someone's life. If that person was dying and you were trying to save their life, okay, God will take that because you're trying to save a life. But if there's a sick person laying there and you make them better on the Sabbath, you're guilty of breaking the Sabbath. In other words, they could be dying, they could be suffering on the Sabbath, and you couldn't do anything because they weren't in danger of dying yet, but you were doing something to make them better. That's ridiculous. But that's the kind of laws that they had. You couldn't make them better. You keep from dying, and you keep them from getting worse. 
but you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. And Christ had healed man of blindness on the Sabbath. And then it was the method of healing by putting the mud on his eyes. There again, I guess they considered that uh, uh, manual labor. But you know what else? It was also, also unlawful to spit on Sunday. Ah, folks, you know there are some churches around nowadays that have rules that are just about that ridiculous. You know, I remember when the year that I met Diane, I went to a Christian school up there in Macon on 247. And did you know, did you know that every so often they did spot inspections on students, okay? And let me tell you what they did. They got a ruler. And the lady teachers would bring the girls in one at a time and measure how far up their dress was. And if it was just a little too high, oh, it was bad. The guys, they would bring in, and the men would pull your ear down, and they'd measure your hair right there. And if your hair was just a little too long, dude, oh, you got an all kinds of They'd call your mom and daddy. He ain't coming back in. You get his hair cut. You know, there was a lot of bowl cuts on guys back then. At least it was off the ear. You know? Come on. I used to think I would die if my dad didn't let my hair grow. Or let me let my grow my hair out. You know what? We uh when my senior year in high school, my daddy let it grow a little bit and it got down to about right him. But that's as far as it was going, you hear me? And I found out it wasn't that good because back then my hair did things it don't do anymore. But, I, you know, when I started playing football, I put that helmet on, and it got to where when I took that helmet off, all that hair was in little curls about that big. And I thought, no, ain't no way. I'm getting this stuff cut off. And it's been cut off ever since. I didn't like them curls on my head. <laughs> Diane liked them. I didn't. <sighs> Let me tell you something. They had laws that were so ridiculous. It, you couldn't spit on, the, on Sunday. Look. Christ realizes something here that, that we need to realize. These are man-made laws. Folks, we don't need to worry so much about that as we need to worry about God's law. Because if we worry about God's law and we keep it, we won't have a problem keeping man's law. We won't. We won't. But Jesus realized these are man-made laws. And not only that, I mean, these, these laws were harmful you want me to tell you why they were harmful? Not only because somebody could die or not be healed because it was a Sabbath day, but that wasn't the reason it was harmful. It was harmful spiritually. Because think about what they were teaching people. They were saying, look, you've got to keep all of these laws that we say you've got to keep. But if you keep these laws, you got it made into heaven. What is that? That's called a work salvation. They were teaching them, without the people knowing it, that you can earn heaven. And folks, there ain't nothing we can do to earn heaven. It's all because of Christ. It's all because of him. What those Pharisees should have been doing was rejoicing with the man because now he had his sight and because God was with them. But they weren't because they thought they knew better. They wanted him killed. Can you believe that? They said, we're the ones who the authorities on God. And they were talking to God. They, we're the ones who are the authority, not this man, Jesus. He's not an authority. We know God. But yet they were plotting to kill God, but not on the Sabbath. You remember when they finally found him guilty and said, we're going to crucify him, they said, get him up there before dinner time because we ain't going to have this on our conscience about crucifying somebody on the Sabbath. Lord have mercy. Straining it naps. Good. But there are people, there are Christians that live like that nowadays. The other thing we need to look at is the man's testimony. You know, when this man first got healed, stop and think about it. When this man first got healed, there were probably a lot of people that said, Wait a minute, you you were blind, but you can see? And they were probably saying, How many fingers am I holding up? He probably didn't know. He'd never seen three fingers before in his life. You know? He probably didn't know. They were going, what color is my coat? You know? What? I don't know. He didn't have any point of reference for color either. But I can see you. If you look at me, and say, you got a big nose and big ears. And short hair. <laughs> you know? He could see. 
and they and they, and they were amazed at it. They said, "How did it happen?" And you know what? He was probably really excited, and he probably told every little detail. He had to tell every little detail. Now look, I, I got a buddy. Jerry knows him, and you gonna know who I'm talking about. When he starts telling you a story, it'll take him thirty minutes to tell you a five minute story. You know why? Because he's got to put every little detail in there, as he's just meticulous that way, and and tells a good story. I got to tell you, that's one reason I love him so much. I love listening to him tell a story. Because when he finally brings it to a conclusion, it's like, that was great. <coughs> you know, he was probably that way. This man was probably giving them every detail. Well, there I was, sitting at the gate. I hadn't been able to see my whole life. And all of a sudden, I heard this man that they called Jesus come walking by. And you know what? He was talking to his disciples. I heard him talking. And then all of a sudden, he bent down. And he was taking care of me. And he spit on the ground. And, and, and you know, it was real dusty. But he spit on the ground. And he made some clay. And he put it on my eyes. He looked at me and said, now, you go wash the pool so long. And you know what? I ran into so many people getting to that pool, but I went. And I went as fast as I could. He'd probably tell them every single detail. Because he was excited about it. But folks, these Pharisees asked him. And they brought the Pharisees him that four times was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And then the Pharisees again asked him how he received his sight. So the Pharisees are now asking Tell us how you received your sight. Now, the Pharisees had heard the story already because they heard about, excuse me, this blind man that could now see, and they started asking people. And guess what? These people told the Pharisees exactly what the blind man had told them. He started telling the Pharisees the story. So they knew what happened, but they wanted to hear it from the blind man. And so they got him in there, and they said, Tell us again how you received your sight. Now look at what he said. It says, And then again the Pharisees also asked him how he received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay on my eyes, I washed, and I'm seated. Pretty short and to the point. Isn't it? You see, he was refining his testimony, wasn't he? Do you think the Pharisees really liked this guy when they brought him in? Were they trying to be an encouragement to him? Were they trying to encourage him to come to God's house and worship God and to teach him what he had never been able to learn before? No, they were in there. They didn't like him because he stood for this man, Jesus. And anybody that stood with Jesus, they were against him. Sounds like the devil to me, don't you? You know what? You know why you run in opposition? Started looking at the book of Job this morning. A lot of parallels here. A lot of parallels. Listen, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're not going to face conflict. And sometimes, you know, we still in the back of our minds have this idea that bad things happen to people who bad, do bad things. And that, that good things happen to good people. Okay, let me tell you something. That, that's false. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that. You look at Job and you'll find out that sometimes really bad, tragic things happen to really good people. God allowed this conflict but he allowed it for a reason. God has a purpose in everything. And that is so that he can be glorified. And that's what it was with Job's life. Maybe that's what it is when we run up against our time. Maybe that's what it was when this man, you know what? God was glorified in this because they called that man in. But they called him in and they said, tell us again what happened. And his testimony was being simplified and sharpened. It was getting more to the point. But look what he was focusing on now. You know, when he started telling his testimony before, he, he started out by saying, well, there I was sitting at the gate, blind because I had been blind from birth. But now when the Pharisees asked him, what did he say? It says, he, he made mud put on my eyes. He told me to go watch, and I did. And now I can see. You see what he's doing? He was focusing on Christ. Do you think that's what the Pharisees wanted? Do you think that's what they intended when they asked him the question? Do you think they expected him to start off a different way? No. This man had been questioned. This man realized what was going on. This man realized that there was something different about Jesus. And his testimony was being refined and sharpened and shortened. But he realized that he had to put the focus where it ought to be. And that was on Jesus Christ. It was to the point. 
Folks, when we come up against opposition, it ought to sharpen our testimony. It ought to make us more intent on telling them about Jesus because that's our testimony. You know what? It's not hard to share your testimony. Just tell them what Jesus did for you. But keep the focus on Jesus. That's your testimony. It's Christ. And that's what this man was doing. But I want you to look at the results. He gave his testimony, and there's two things that I noticed that happened when he gave his testimony. Number one, it was effective. Now, when I say effective, listen to this. Look at verse 16. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. But others, other Pharisees said, How can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. Don't you love this? You take a person that is simple-minded, has never been educated, has been blind their whole life, and they go up against all of these highly educated men who are powerful and have the authority in the nation, and just because of one short, one-sentence testimony, they are now divided because they can't decide. Doesn't the Bible say something about God confusing the wise? I guess it all depends on your, your version, your, your definition of wisdom. But let me tell you something. You know, God speaks through a lot of different people. We talk about it in Sunday school. God can speak through people that ain't Christian. You know that? Let me tell you something. If, if God can speak through a donkey, he can use anybody. He can use anybody. He used this man that had an encounter with Jesus to speak to those Pharisees. They couldn't, they couldn't rebut his testimony. They couldn't say anything about it. They were divided on it. They couldn't even agree. I love it when God does that. Because that's the only explanation for it. God did it. And so what did they do? They looked at the man and said, what do you say about it? Now, wait a minute. Here was a guy who wasn't educated. He wasn't one to live. He wasn't an authority. And now these guys are asking him what he thinks. What do you think we ought to do? What do you think about this man? And he said he is a prophet. Now, that brings me to the second thing I noticed about this man's testimony. The result of his faith is growing. You know how I know that? Because the first time he was asked about how he received his sight, what did he tell the people? He said, this man, Jesus. This man, Jesus. At that point, he thought he was just a man. This is the second time he's being asked, and it's the Pharisees that are asking him. And they said, what do you think about it? He didn't say this man, Jesus, this time. He said, he's a prophet. You see, he's starting to realize there's something about this man, Jesus. Now, you know what? In Scripture, the last time this man talks about Jesus, you know what he says? He says he is the Son of God. His faith had grown. Had you know why his faith grew? Because of conflict. Because of opposition. His faith had grown. His faith was growing. Let me tell you something. There's some things that you've got to remember. And I'm done. But there's things that we as Christians need to remember. Conflict will come. Folks, let me tell you something. You can't live as a Christian in the world we live in today and in the society we live in today and not have conflict. There's going to be conflict. There are going to be people that don't like you because you're a Christian. There are going to be people that hate you because you're a Christian. There are going to be people that falsely accuse you. The Bible says, look, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up the cross. Taking up the cross is pretty serious stuff. And, and, and there's going to be conflict. We know there's going to be conflict. If we are a Christian, conflict will come so we can count on it. But here's what we need to remember when the conflict comes. Number two is when it comes, God will not abandon you. You know, a lot of people, they run into stuff like this and they think God's just abandoned me. God, where are you? You think Job felt that way? I don't think Job felt like God abandoned him, but you know what? When it was just God and Job and nobody else around, Job did ask why, didn't he? Lord, why is this happening? I don't understand. He didn't ask accusing. He just was trying to understand why. And that's what we do sometimes. 
But let me tell you something. Even though we don't think God is there, He is. Because nowhere, no matter where we are, we might not can see God, but God can see us. And then, folks, God's not going to abandon His children in time of conflict. And the third thing that we need to remember is this. God always has a purpose in conflict. So we need to be encouraged. When we're going through conflict, you know what? There's been a lot of times that people have come to me and said, pray for me, I'm going through something right now. And I would always pray for them. But you know what? I always try to encourage them. Because no matter what it is that they're going through, there's a purpose in it. And all we need to do is keep our eyes on God, knowing that He's not abandoning us, that He can always see us, that He's always with us. We need to encourage them because God's purpose will be done. And that purpose is for His glory. And as a Christian, that ought to be what brings us the most joy in our life, is to glorify God. What motivates us? I asked that question this morning. What motivates us to do what we do, whatever it is? Our motivation should be this, to bring glory to the name we live our lives with that, that in mind, to do that one thing, everything that we do, then we should be in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. <coughs> I ask Heavenly Father that we would realize that when conflict comes, not to be discouraged, but to be encouraged. And I pray that we would encourage one another as we go. Along the way, Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be Christians that truly have you in our heart and that we would encourage others as they go through these difficult times in life because, Lord, we know that there's a purpose. We may not understand the purpose, but we know that there's a purpose and the purpose is to glorify you. And, Father, that's what we strive to do in our life. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every one with my brothers and sisters in Christ here tonight. And I, I pray that you would be with those who couldn't be here tonight. And Heavenly Father, I pray that they would be encouraged. And Lord, I don't know what they're going through. They may be going through a time in their life where blessings abound and everything is good and praise God for it. Praise you for it, Heavenly Father. But Heavenly Father, those who are going through trying times, I pray for encouragement for them. And I pray that they would keep their eyes open. Father, we do thank you. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you that it means so much to me to be here with your people in your house in this place. Father, I thank you and I praise you. And Father, I pray that you would take this time and do with it as you will. For it's in your